Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you may know, if you've seen us before, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the months of October, November, and December of the year 2012. The series is entitled Fundamental Beliefs, and for this week we're talking about Revelation and the God revealed in it. This lesson is for October 13 of 2012. We would like to begin, and we'd like to encourage you to join us in a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we wish we knew you better. May we learn from this lesson more about you and about your character and about your word that teaches us about you. May this also be a help to those who are listening and watching is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are many things that we can learn from nature. There are a lot of things we can learn from personal experience. But the most specific things by far that we can learn about God are from His Word, known as the Bible or the Scriptures. It's only through the Bible that we learn about things like the great controversy over God's character and government, the accusations that Satan has made against God, which form a part or basically the issues in that great controversy. Seventh-day Adventists can also look to the inspiration of Ellen White and the many details she has given us about this great controversy. In this particular lesson, we will focus on the Bible and what the meaning of inspiration is. I don't know if you're very familiar with the backgrounds of these words, but of course inspiration is talking about breathing in. Every time you take a deep breath, that's an inspiration. But in this case, the word inspiration speaks specifically about words, thoughts, ideas, mental pictures that are prepared for us and brought to us through scriptures, and those ideas we presume we believe come from God. Now there's a couple of verses that we often turn to when we talk about inspiration. Let's take a quick look at those first of all. Look at 2 Peter 1, uh, 19 through 21. And if you give me just a moment, I will enlarge my print here so it's easier for you to read. So we are even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. And those of you who are somewhat familiar with the Bible know that that word morning star is actually a translation of Latin, or not a translation from the Latin, but could be translated into Latin as Lucifer. And you remember there was once an angel in heaven by the name of Lucifer, and this morning star is sometimes also translated day star, and it's used as a word, uh, a term, a name that refers to Christ himself. Above all else, however, remember that no one can explain by himself or herself a prophecy in the scriptures. In other words, God did not intend for us, to each one, to form our own little church and, and have our own set of beliefs and choose to interpret the scriptures however we want. For no prophetic message I'm reading on Eve ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. And one other passage that's very familiar, 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 16. My Good News Bible says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Now, some of you will recognize that uh, there's a bit of a problem with that last verse. Uh, and it depends on which version you read from. Um, and yes. if you look in the footnote of the Good News Bible, okay. it says every inspired, e pardon me, every scripture inspired by God is also useful. Yes. So that, uh, which in actual fact is most likely what Paul intended to say. 
Now, why do we say that? And people can say, oh, no, you're, you're ruining one of our favorite verses for the inspiration of Scripture. No, we're not. Because when Paul was writing to Timothy, and remember, 2 Timothy was written as Paul's last book. He's in his final days in the Mamertine prison in Rome, waiting to be beheaded by Nero and his cohorts. But um, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he knew that Timothy didn't have a nice bound version of the King James Bible that we might think of when someone says scripture in our day. Timothy had a pile of scrolls, if he had any at all, and he would have to choose. Do I want this one or that one or this one or that one? Or, and many of those scrolls that were available, in Tim, even in Timothy's day, were not inspired. At least we would say they were not inspired today. Things that came to be known later as the New Testament Apocrypha or the Old Testament Apocrypha, or even the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. I have two big volumes, thick volumes like that at home, Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha. That's some kind of a false. Are these? Pig or something? What's a mm. pseudepigrapha? Pseudepigraph means a false written upon. And literally, it means a a letter or a book that is written claiming to have been written by someone else who could not possibly have written that letter. So it's, it's someone who is forging someone else's name to their, their material. So that's, when you say you've got two big books, you mean you've got two big books of, filled with all kinds of fake documents. Yes. yes. Falsely entitled, would that be a Falsely word? entitled is a, you know, a way of Same. really sort of a brief translation of that pseudepigrapha. Now, could, a, a good, a, go ahead. could they be really written by the person that you're saying they're written no. by, but not included in the Bible? No. Oh. For, uh, the reason, let me give you the classic example of that. There are four books, um, and some of them quite widely read in Timothy's day, claiming to have been written by Enoch. I mean, if they were written by Enoch, they would have been, and by the way, these are written in, I believe, Greek now, not even in Hebrew or, or Aramaic, uh, <laughs> and, and you're saying <laughs> they survived from the days of Enoch, uh, through the flood, the flood, back before the flood? I mean, before obviously. They had Greek. What? Before Greek was before a language. Before Greek was a language, exactly. Or translations. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, this gives you just an example. So while we don't have time or space to discuss exactly in detail how inspiration works, we should note that at some places in Scripture, God, working through the Holy Spirit, has passed a message down through angels often to inspire prophets and apostles. And when those prophets and apostles receive those messages, you, often in the form of visual representations or something of that nature, then that prophet or apostle has to try to struggle to put down what he saw or heard in human language. Then now, and, and historically what has happened, those, cop, those books have been recognized as being inspired by God. People have made multiple hand copies of those documents. Later, much later in cases of the Old Testament books particularly, those things were then translated into other languages and finally into modern languages that we can read. And ultimately, we would say that if the original idea that God had in mind filtered down through all those steps and gets to us, and that idea that we, we come up with when we read it in our minds is something close to what God intended originally, then inspiration has happened. Inspiration is not in a book. Inspiration is in here. And it doesn't mean that I'm inspired and I can sort of say what I want. It means that when God's idea gets finally to my head, and if I have comprehended it somewhat correctly, then that is inspiration. Now, what do we do about the fact that I suggested that it should have said every scripture inspired of God is profitable? Um, as we mentioned, there weren't books in, in Timothy's day. No nicely bound things with leather covers and that kind of stuff. So what did Timothy have? Like we said, a pile of scrolls. And 
the, probably the longest scroll that you could have. Well, the best example we have available for us to look at today is probably the Isaiah scroll, which is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's long. I don't know exactly. It's more than 30 feet, I'm sure. I should have looked up maybe the exact length of it, but it, it's lengthy. Most scrolls were much shorter than that. And uh, so Timothy had to decide when he looked down at those scrolls and picked up one and started reading, which ones were inspired and which ones weren't. And Paul is saying, Timothy, you know what the criteria are. You know how to make a decision which ones of those scrolls are inspired and which ones are not. So now, my first major question to you is, how do you decide which ones are inspired? Oh, that's already, that's already been decided. Already been decided. Did, did Paul... Whom? <laughs> did he lay out the criteria for Timothy, or did he just say no, you know? No, he didn't. Well, maybe privately or at some time when he was teaching him, but as far as scripture and scripture, no, he did not. He didn't. But you know, he said. But I know what he said? No, he said Timothy knows how to yeah. select the correct one. That's ones. what he said. Now, are you saying that all scripture is inspired, uh, the ideas are inspired, or the words are inspired? Well, then that's a question. And, and I might, uh, maybe I should just add to the fact that to make things a little more complicated, Roman Catholics have a different Bible than the one that Protestants have. Roman Catholics have parts of 14 extra books that Protestants don't believe are inspired. We call it the Apocrypha. They, were, they call it Deuterocanonical, a second canon. And or, the Orthodox churches in the East have a different Bible again. Not hugely different, but some different than what we have. So we've got at least three Bibles available, widely available today that are all at least a little bit different. Three. We would we refer to these as Christian Bibles. These would be, these are Christian Bibles, yeah. Yeah. And that's, not, that, and that's apart from, from Jewish scriptures or certainly apart from the Koran or any of those other, from other religions. Well, I'm certainly glad I've got them. The correct one. Right? right, exactly. I'm glad that you picked out the right one. <laughs> I, I heard a minister talking about this a long time ago, and I don't remember who it was, but made the comment that in the Catholic Douay version, apart from all the other stuff that's in it, there is enough in there to give somebody and convert them to basic salvation, which I thought was very interesting. Well, and that's, that's an important point. The important point is that you could use any one of those Bibles. I have a number of Catholic Bibles. I have many Protestant Bibles. I have Bibles in many different languages, even here on my computer. Um, but having said all that, if you take the whole of Scripture and, and you, you, you take the picture as presented all the way through Scripture, you're going to be pretty safe, no matter which one of those versions you take. It's only in certain areas where there's, you know, differences of opinion. Are you saying that a Christian is safe in the Catholic Bible? Yes. All parts of the Catholic Bible? It read widely, it's safe. Yes. It's exactly like the standard Protestant Bible. It's just got some extra, some extra books. books. Some of these yeah. Additions and a couple yes. of changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what criteria should we actually use in deciding which books are reliable? The new books should not counterdict the old books. Very good. That's a very important principle. The idea is that truth always, if you know enough details, the truth must always be consistent with itself. Because God is consistent with himself. Well, not only that, but if you stop and think about it, if two things are actually cor both true, then if you, figure, if you can eventually figure out how they're related, they're, they, you know, they will be consistent. You know? You may have two people who witness an accident and their stories sound very different, but if you could put the whole thing back together and see this guy was standing over here and that guy was standing over there and this is how things took, yeah, okay, that's exactly what happened. They just saw it from two different perspectives. If you know the whole story, uh, then you can, you can put it together. Well, uh, I, I, I posed a question that's a little bit difficult, but let me, let me try at least a brief answer. What has happened with our Christian Bible is that down through the ages, churches and individuals and scholars and so forth have looked at all of these 
books that have been available. And gradually what's happened is that churches have said, we find this collection of books to be reliable, helpful, non-contradictory, and so we like this set. And eventually churches have said, yeah, we think this is the right set. But that didn't happen until a long time after people had generally chosen and said, yes, these are the right ones. So we can accept the judgments of our forebears in the Christian church. Uh, About what year general. did they come to a final decision? Well, the fi there wasn't a really a final decision until probably around uh, really 1800 was, was when our Protestant Bibles finally came to be more or less in the form that they are today. And when did the printing press come about? <coughs> Printing was invented in 1451, I believe. Okay. That date is approximately right. So it is conceivable that one of Paul's writings is stuffed in some jar or something somewhere. That's right, yeah, and so on and so forth. It is conceivable that a legitimate material could uh, emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Paul talks about books, letters that he wrote that we don't have. But here's, the, here's another thing. We have to trust that God and the Holy Spirit are very concerned about their word. Yes. And the Bible would be watched over diligently by God to make exactly. sure that important stuff came through. Well, and also to, that the inspiration, and I've mentioned that this, this concept before, the inspiration doesn't end with with the writing, mm -hmm. or the author, the inspiration, where, where an author is one individual who is being inspired to place this out for others to read. We've got six or seven of us here tonight that are reading, mm -hmm. and, and the Holy Spirit is just as much with us as he was then. So the, yeah. the Spirit is there to help read and to interpret. For Seventh-day Adventists, uh, the writings of Ellen White have proved very helpful. Many of us believe that she was inspired in a manner similar to Bible writers. She said these two statements, which are quite significant, I think. She said, the Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. That was originally found in Review and Herald, December 15, 1885. Has been copied in various sources. Probably the easiest um, available is the Selective Messages, Book 1, page 416. Exactly what does the word creed mean? Creed is, comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. And a creed is a, a fixed set of, of beliefs, or a belief, or a set of beliefs that defines your church. Okay. And we have, we have always talked about having present truth. Present truth means what? What Jesus is doing now? Well, yes, but more than that, what does present truth imply? Something more than yesterday's truth, right? right. And maybe a little bit less than tomorrow's truth. Well, so it's we're like, talking about... It's like math. Uh, mm -hmm. You study math and you find new truths that uh, build on old truths until eventually you end up on the moon. Yeah, exactly. Even in Mars, huh? Mm-hmm. So... You said a creed is a is a set of beliefs and so on and so forth. And we're, we're aren't we studying fundamental beliefs, beliefs of our church yeah. this quarter? So are we studying is this kind of contradictory? Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't could the we argue that this is our creed? Wouldn't some say this is our creed? And here, our faithful author here, Ellen White, is saying, well, the Bible is that's our creed, not these things right here. Okay. The difference is this. We have not set in stone our set of beliefs. We're constantly trying to upgrade it and prove it. And that's the idea of present truth. Um, Ellen White also said, every chapter and every verse of the Bible is a communication from God to man. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 504 and elsewhere. So, um, those are interesting ideas. The Bible, remember, was written by inspired men, but it is not God's mode of thought or expression. 
it is that of humanity. This is, again, some words from Ellen White. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put himself in words, in logic and rhetoric on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not his pen. Look at the different writers. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on the man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, is imbued with thoughts. But the words receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will. Thus, the utterances of the man are the word of God. That's found again in Selected Messages, book one, page 21, uh, paragraphs one and two. You know, God says, let us reason together. Isaiah okay. 118. When you reason with God, you need to know what God says, and then you can reason with him. But some people actually just never read the Bible and just in their minds start reasoning with God and then really they're just reasoning with themselves yeah and so god has given us something that we need to study and then we can reason with god based on his word yeah well one of the challenges of inspiration is what are there what what happens if there seem to be contradictions is it possible for inspired writers to apparently at least contradict each other well, let's take some examples. Look at Matthew 27, 37. Now, this is talking about Christ being crucified on Calvary, and Pilate wrote some words on a plaque and put it on the, had it placed on the, on the cross above the head of Jesus. So it says here, above his head, they put the written notice of the accusation against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Okay, what did it say? This is Jesus, the King of the Jews, right? Mark 15, 26, the notice of the accusation against him said, the King of the Jews. Now, that's not too much different, right? Part of what the other one said. What about Luke 23, 38? Above him are written these words, this is the King of the Jews. Now, what, what did it say? Is one of the writers correct and the other writers wrong? That's not a big difference, but it's different. Are they even different in the original language? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, it does seem to be a bit of a puzzle because there's not very many words there. That, no. That they'd have to. I mean, if it was but, a big long sentence, you could say. Yeah. Understand that they might yeah. get things out of. How long after Jesus' crucifixion were these books written? Probably and how long a, are we relying on the yeah. memory of Matthew, Mark, Luke? Probably about 30 to 35 years. Yeah, which is a while. I might forget a couple words. Okay, but there's, there's more to the story of this, and I'm not sure why our lesson didn't mention this, but look at John 19. Now we'll turn to the other gospel writer. Look at John 19, verse 20. Many people are talking about this same notice. Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross. Jesus of, Nazareth, I'm, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. Many people read it because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city. The notice was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Now, who is writing this? Well, it says Pilate is the one who no, arranged it. I mean, who wrote this? Was, was this? This is the Gospel of John. John. Uh -huh. Okay, John. John. John was there, right? Yes. Okay, who wrote the other three that we read? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay. Was Luke was Math a Greek. Matthew was not there. Matthew, we are not aware that Matthew ever saw it. Was Mark there? No. We are not aware that he ever, he might have, we're just not aware that and he ever Luke saw it. And Luke was not there. Luke was definitely not there. He was a Greek physician. But John was there. John was there. So that would lead me to believe that John saw uh, is saying that there were three but, languages okay those of you who know more than one language we now have a message in three languages how is it how, what are the chances that each of those languages says exactly the same thing see what languages well, you, did the other three if you've, speak? Ever, if you've ever studied a foreign mm -hmm. language 
and had to do some translating, things don't come out exactly. That's right. Same. So I think that if we read John along with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the problem would be resolved. Let's look at some other examples. But the, the critical thing is the message is the same. Yes, the message is the same. Yeah. Now there are, here, here's something that's a little more complicated. Look at 1 Kings 6 verse 1. This is a verse that most of us probably have not paid any attention to, <laughs> but it's a very important verse for, for conservative Christians. It says this, 480 years after the people of Israel left Egypt, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the second month, the month of Ziv, Solomon's temp Solomon began work on the temple. Now, does that sound pretty specific? Yes. It gives exact year, the exact month, details, right? Well, and when did the people leave, Israel, uh, leave, leave Egypt? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, they left at one time. Okay. Yeah, they left okay. all together at the same time. Over the time. Red Sea. They left Egypt okay. on Passover, that original, the first Passover. Okay. So now, are we going to believe these words or not? Who wrote this? Well, we don't know for sure. But here's the challenge. If you look at archaeologically and you study Palestine, you discover that according to archaeological methods, whether they're reliable or not, maybe we don't have all the data, but the stuff that's been dug up so far, it looks like a bunch of people moved into Palestine and built new houses, started new communities around the year 1200 BC. Well, Solomon's temple was, written, was built somewhere around nine, the beginning was around 960 BC. We can date that pretty well. Well, if you put, count back 480 years, you're back to 1440 or 1450 BC. Now we got a problem. Do we believe what, we, what seems to be the evidence from archaeology, or do we, do we believe this verse from the Bible? Now, not being math challenged, um, so Solomon's temple is completed before well, not completed. It was started it around was started 960. Before um, these new homes were made, right? Oh. No, no, no. He, 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 it was afterwards. That was so. Oh, okay. Later. So the new homes came about, and then Solomon's temple was started. Right. Well, the implication is that the new homes were built when the Israelites moved from. Egypt to Canaan. Yeah, that, that's that, the that's idea. the assumption that people make, but it's a couple hundred years different than this. But, but stop and think about it. There were plenty of people in Canaan before the Israelites got there. What happened to those homes? And why would the children of Israel moving in be the only ones who might have built new homes? Now there's a new type of home, and how do they date those things? They date them using pottery and, and, and language and the way things are written, although there's very few language samples from that period, time period. So here's the problem. And, and then people turn around and say, well, we can't really believe the Exodus story because, look, it's off by, you know, the what? things, according to our dating, for example, our the dating of the archaeologists of the, of the destruction of Jericho didn't happen at the time that they think the children of Israel arrived at Palestine. But what, what does the building of a new neighborhood and several homes have to do with the starting of the Temple of Solomon? I mean, so, well, no, so no. some people built some new homes in several hundred years before Solomon's Temple started. Well, the idea is that they say, well, look, a whole nation of people moved in. They had to have somewhere to live. They must have been the ones who built these new homes. That's, that's assuming a lot. <laughs> I'm not arguing with that. <laughs> haven't, haven't the methods of archaeology changed somewhat over the years? I mean, if you read anything current, they're still scrapping over whether David's kingdom was here or there, or does this belong to the time of David? I yeah. don't think archaeology is quite as accurate as they like to think. In well, that's, circumstances, that's the challenge. The question is, do you, do you believe these words in Scripture? Yes. Don't take that as against the other. It sounds like whoever wrote these words 
felt pretty certain about what they were writing. Doesn't it sound that way? Well, these archaeologists find a tooth and they think it belongs to a man that was 2,000 years old. Yeah, well. I mean, so they find a new ha few new houses. Okay. I don't know. Well, let's not, let's not argue with the archaeologists. I mean, let's not belittle the archaeologists because we don't know, you know, how they do their... I mean, none of us are professional archaeologists. And At we, the same time... We always like it when they, when they validate what we believe. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, that's true also. Okay, let's look at some, some other examples. Look at Acts 118. With the money that Judas got for his evil act, he bought a field where he fell to his death. He burst open and all his bowels spilled out. Okay, Judas did what? Bought a field. He took the money that he got for... Selling. Betraying Jesus. Betraying Jesus. He bought a field. He fell to his death. He, bow, he burst open, etc. Okay? What is Matthew 27, 5? Another story where he threw the money at the priest's yeah. feet? Or yes. Yeah. Is that what we're, we're getting ready to read here? Well, <laughs> I mean, how do we put the... Look at, look at Matthew 27, 5. Jesus threw the coins down in the temple and left. Jesus. Then he went off and hanged him. Hanged himself. Okay, you can't take the money and buy a field and go and, 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 and fall down and your bowels burst open at the same time take, take, that, some, some money, that take that same money into the temple and throw it at the feast, feet of the priests. You see, that proves that you can't rely on this inspiration. When you, hang your, when you hang yourself and you're there long enough, do your bowels split open? Well, now, let's listen. See, these, these, these kind of contradictions happen because people don't read very carefully or they don't read widely enough. Read on and listen to what it says. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, This is blood money, and it is against our law to put it in the temple treasury. After reaching their agreement about it, they used the money to buy Potter's Field as a cemetery for foreigners. That is why that field is called Field of Blood to this very day. Okay, so how do we put all that together? Well, it's very interesting that Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages said these words. Later that same day, on the road from Pilate's Hall to Calvary, there came, and this is talking about the crowd following Jesus on his way to Calvary, there came an interruption to the shouts and jeers of the wicked throng who were leading Jesus to the place of crucifixion. As they passed a retired spot, they saw at the foot of a lifeless tree the body of Judas. So he died which day? Same day Jesus did. Same day Jesus did. It was a most revolting sight. His weight had broken the cord by which he had hanged himself to the tree. And falling, remember the verse that said about he fell? His body had been horribly mangled and dogs were now devouring it. What would they tear open first? His belly. His belly. His remains were immediately buried out of sight. But there was less mockery among the throng and many a pale face revealed the thoughts within. Retribution seemed already visiting those who were guilty of the blood of Jesus. So that sounds like a good way to put the stories together, right? If you read the whole context. Okay, let's try some more. Virtually all apparently contradictory or problem texts in Scripture can be explained either through a careful look at the original languages or a comparison with other biblical passages. Ellen White often proved to be very helpful as well as we have just seen. While many apparently challenging ideas from Scripture can thus be worked out, there are some things which we as human beings will never be able to fully understand. Let's, let's take a look at a couple of verses. Genesis 1.26 Then God said, And now we will make human beings, they will be like us and resemble us, they will have power over the fish, the birds and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. Okay? So what's going to happen? God is, well, God made us to be like himself, right? Deuteronomy 4, 6, 4 is an interesting verse in that respect. Israel, remember this. This is the famous Shema because the word Shema means listen in, in, in Hebrew. The Lord and the Lord alone is our God. But if you read the footnote, you learn something interesting. 
And here are the possibilities. The Lord and the Lord alone is our God. That's one possibility. Or it could be translated, the Lord our God is the only God. Or even the Lord our God is one. So this gives you an idea how things can be translated in different way, ways. All three meanings are probably intended. The person, uh, when, when Moses wrote this or spoke it, he probably intended for all those things to be understood. Well, many texts in both the Old Testament and the New Testament refer to a trinity or a triune God. Christians believe that while God is one, he, they, consist of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image, but God is one. We may not be able to explain this in human terms, but someday God will be able to explain it to us as far as we are able to comprehend it. The fact that there are some things about God we cannot fully understand means simply that He is God and we are created beings. If we could understand everything about God, He wouldn't be any better off than we. He wouldn't be any more powerful or any better, any higher than we are. So why is it important for us to believe in a trinity? Because God says we and... So. And He mentions Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, why is that important? Well, that's something God wants us to know about Him. Presumably it's true. Mm -hmm. So how are we supposed to understand it? Are all three of those members fully God? That's what it says. Was Jesus, when He came to this earth as a human being, fully God and fully man? Yes. We believe Sometimes that. Sometimes people think too much. <laughs> I mean, what's the matter with just believing and you'll see when you get there? Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is that there's a lot of questions that we could ask that are probably unanswerable at this point in time. Adventists being scientists do ask a lot of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the purpose of asking such questions? Well, it, it challenges us to study more carefully, and that's probably a good thing. In any case, we must recognize that the Bible does not go to any length to try to explain the nature of God or even His existence. And read Steps to Christ, page 105. God expects us simply to read, to ask questions, to answer those questions as far as humanly possible, and on that basis to come to understand Him and trust Him. Now, one of the ways that we as a group and others that have associated with us have tried to do that is by reading the Bible all the way through looking at every book and every chapter and every story with the one major question, what does this say to us about God? And if you look at our website, it's entitled, or it's named Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you'll be able to, to, to see there a number of study guides that are there for almost every book of the Bible. We're still working on the last few uh, that will show you how we take this approach. I must say that's a different approach than other churches, and it teaches you so much when you start reading and you say, what does this tell me about God? Mm -hmm. Really? By well, the way, on the same website, there is a 25-week series on how the Bible came to us that yes. goes over in, a, in depth the history of the Bible. Yeah. And it's available on, under resources and then featured topics and how the Bible came to us, audios and handouts. Thank and you. How, for and how Satan tried to prevent it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what does God intend for us to do with the Bible? Look at Hebrews 11:6. No one can please God without faith. For whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists. He must believe, he must trust that God exists and rewards those who seek him. Okay? So we need faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing the Word of God. Sometimes reading, reading the Bible because there's a lot of stories in there that take a lot of faith. Okay. Take a lot of faith or give a lot of faith? Both. Well, I don't know. When you read the, when you read the story at the beginning about this talking snake that tricks this guy that's made of mud into eating some magical ample that 
<laughs> the ball results are measles, mumps, and all the evil things on the planet, and even squirrels and rabbits get sick and die because of this. That, that takes a lot of that takes a lot of faith to believe a story like that. Okay. Well, the Bible tells us where faith is supposed to come from. It says in Romans ten seventeen. So, so then faith comes from hearing the message, and without going into a lot of detail, in biblical times, not many people could read. So when a book would, be, would come to a local church, someone would be asked to, to sit up in front, or possibly even stand up in front, and open the scroll and read it, through usually probably from beginning to end without stopping. So most Christians would learn about God by listening. So faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ, or some document says uh, the preaching about God. So the Bible was intended primarily to teach us about God. That's its main purpose. Uh, it makes a lot of very significant and very important statements about God. We sometimes call them heuristic statements. Look, for example, at Malachi 3, verse 6. I am the Lord, and I do not change. And so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not yet completely lost. I'm you, God, I do not change. You, you used a pretty fancy term there, heuristic. Mm -hmm. you, I'm not sure very many people understand what that word means. Maybe even me. Can you define that? Yeah, here is that the, some ancient Bible theologian, or was there some guy named Hewer? Or <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> let me just give you a very simplistic explanation of the word heuristic. Heuristic is a word that implies that it has a lot of implications, a lot of meanings. It's important for study. It can be expanded and, and, and encourages people to dig in and, and, and learn more. Okay. James 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift present comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. He doesn't change, right? Well, what about 1 John 4, 8? Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And if you, you look down at verse 16 in the same chapter, he says basically the same thing. And we ourselves know and believe that love, uh, the love which God has for us. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. Those in statements have incredible implications. So these are claims about God yes. and uh, the like. Where do we get the evidence to support well, that? Well, let me read one more and then let's talk about because that's the really important issue. But can you, O oh God, really live on earth among men and women? Not even all heaven is large enough to hold you. So how can this temple that I have built, this is, this is Solomon in his prayer dedicating the temple, how can this temple that I have built be large enough? So don't we believe God is omnipresent, everywhere present? We, that's a belief that's common to many Christian groups. Everywhere present at all times. Apparently. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it be a mistake to just read these verses and say, yeah, okay, fine, thanks, bye. The rest of Scripture gives us the evidence upon which to base that trust and faith. Do we see evidence in the rest of Scripture that these things are true? That's the question. So these are hypotheses or statements that need support, and the rest of Scripture gives that support? Well, they don't give the statement first and then give the support. They actually, the Bible gives us support first, and then it draws this conclusion. Remember, these verses occur way at the end, most of them. Okay? Well, God well, is love. is hard for a lot of people to... Um, uh, put together the Old Testament and the New Testament, that God is loved throughout the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, when he's shouting on the top of Mount Zani and shaking the whole mountain as a big black cloud and lightning is shooting and out. And when he's splitting the earth and yeah. having people who drop disobeyed into drop into it. And, and when he sends a flood to yeah. um, purge the earth of uh, evil, except for Noah and his family. Yeah. It's a little hard to see a loving God in the Old Testament for many people. I, I know we've studied and you know, it, it is consistent, but it's hard for people. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Well, while the great controversy involves the entire universe before whom G Satan made his accusations against God, his character, and the way he runs his government, nevertheless, as human beings, we primarily get to know God through his interactions with us, at least as, as, as a human race, I us individually or other human beings. However much... Um, is God, how much is God involved in human history? You just mentioned he sent a flood. Can we, what else did he do? He helped the children of Israel get out of Egypt, didn't he? Destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. What else could we say? He put Jonah in a fish and then took him out of the fish. And John 3.16 says, for God loved the world so much that he gave his son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Is that the same God that was apparently shouting on the top of Mount Sinai? And then there's 1 Thessalonians 4.17, then we who are loving at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will always be with the Lord. Well sometimes are you the same parent who is um who is um, speaking sharply to your kid or punishing him, yet maybe weeping and helping the kid when he's sick. Is yeah. that the same, is that a loving parent? All Same idea. Mm -hmm. Well, we know, how, how much history do we know about human beings? Or, or even, even, let's take the, 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 the idea of sin. What's the earliest thing in scripture that talks about sin? Well, it, the Bible tells about sin starting in heaven. Yeah. So where would we read about that? Do you know? Revelation well, twelve. Revelation, Revelation twelve speaks about that. Yeah, it's Revelation specific. twelve talks about the rebellion which started right there in heaven when when Lucifer, one of the chief angels, began to make accusations and and, and things no. so, against God. Actually, that there are there are other other references, but. That's quite specific yeah. in Revelation. It's unusual. It seems unusual that they'd wait clear to the very last book of the Old Testament to kind of, you know, really be so explicit about that. Now, know, all that, that, that was before Adam and Eve. Do you know how long before Adam and Eve that was? <clears throat> we don't know that. What we do know is that it must have happened before Adam and Eve because he was, Satan was cast down to this earth. What was here before Adam and Eve? That's a good question. He was, Satan was cast down to this earth and then by the time the Garden of Eden is established and there's a tree, then Satan is there saying, okay, I need my place in the, in the garden also. So we're pretty, pretty confident that Revelation 12 happened before Genesis 1. And then Satan is um, disguising himself as a serpent mm -hmm. or he chose a serpent to be. So today Satan can disguise himself in different things to tempt you. Absolutely. So we see that God was involved with this controversy from before this earth was created all the way down until Revelation 20, 21, 22. Talk about a second coming, a third coming, the destruction of all evil, sin, Lucifer, etc., and the creation of an entirely new heaven and new earth. Now, war in heaven, does that mean they had nuclear bombs in heaven and they shot at each other? We, we have no idea what weapons were used. What, from what we read, it sounds more like it was a war of ideas. Maybe a political um, disagreement? Pretty serious disagreement, I would say, yeah. I think the bottom line is God created the angels, and if he can't get rid of them, we got a problem, and he obviously did. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. see there's a problem. He'd have a problem. Well, Matthew, it says, I saw Satan fall like fire from heaven, so that's 
Yeah, that, that's in, in um, Luke 18. Luke 18, okay. So that was early on that, that he'd said, as far yeah. as um, we didn't wait till uh, Revelation yeah. for that. Well, but before God can save and heal human beings, he must answer Satan's questions and accusations to the satisfaction of the remaining members of God's family throughout the universe. It's hard for us as self-centered human beings to realize that we are not the center of the universe. But we need to understand that. Look, for example, at the following passages. Now, these are hard for some people to accept, and they're not the passages normally quoted when talking about God. So well, I would ask you to listen very carefully. The first one I'm going to read to you is found in the Signs of the Times, July 12 of 1889. I'm sorry, 1899. It says this, it was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption. Who is it that needs the redemption? Heavenly universe, the heavenly angels. But who needs the redemption? It's us that needs the redemption. But what are the, who needs to understand the conditions about the covenant of redemption? The, the heavenly universe. The angels and the other beings that are in the universe trying to understand what in the heck's going on down yeah. here. It's because of that that Christ bore the penalty in behalf of the human race. The throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure even though the race, that would be the human race, be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. Now God didn't have to do that. He's going to succeed. He's going to win the great controversy, or he has, and he's going to wrap it all up without having to destroy us. But First and foremost, what has to happen? God has to answer the questions, the accusations against him. He has to make sure that the rest of the universe is satisfied that he's trustworthy, etc. Or winning the great controversy wouldn't have any meaning at all. So the plan of salvation is for us, but, we're, but for the whole universe also. Exactly. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled, and the human race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. In other words, any accusations against God will be answered by what? By the life and death of Jesus Christ, if, I, if it's understood correctly. Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth, his trial and the judgment hall, his crucifixion? Were any of you there? I wasn't there. Who really saw all those things? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan, and his angels. So who were the ones who really saw what happened that time? Every, everybody but us. Everybody. We were the ones who were, the message really needs to be given to, but we weren't paying attention. The disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane that were supposed to be paying attention were doing what? Sleeping. Sleeping. And this is because war started in heaven, and so God needs to clear up the uh, controversy in heaven as well as on earth. Let me read you another passage. <clears throat> The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. By the way, before I read on, this is found in the Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. And I'm going to read from paragraph 6 and paragraph 9 of, of that uh, article by Ellen White. He was pictured, God was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one, represented as belonging to the character of God. And Jesus came. Now, that's what we want to know. Why did Jesus came? come? Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. He was God. The questions were about Him. So we can see what He did. We can know what God is like. 
The only way in which he could, the only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him, that is to the Father, the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And those are both found statements in John 17. When the object of his mission was attained, again, what was the purpose of Christ's mission to this earth? The revelation of God to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. Very, very significant statement there from the pen of Ellen White. So we are to know who God is by looking at Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. His main purpose for coming here was not to pay some legal penalty or to, to somehow do some magical thing that we don't really understand that makes it possible for God to save us. His main purpose was to come down here to teach us about himself and about the Father. And, and very much about what we are to be like. Yeah. We live in a world that is reluctant to believe anything that cannot be put in a test tube or tested by some scientific method. This is one of Satan's most successful means of trying to deny the supernatural. While we recognize that science and technology have made our lives a lot easier and probably safer and healthier, there are limits to what science can do. If we choose to believe that the only reliable information comes from something we can put in a test tube, then we, by definition, are ruling out the possibility of God. Um, by definition, historical information cannot be tested in the laboratory. We certainly would not want to redo the Second World War just to prove that it happened. The Bible is essentially a historical document. Isaiah 40 through 55 tells us the criteria that Isaiah suggests, at least, we should use to determine who the real, real God is. With our very busy schedules and multitudinous distractions in the 21st century, it's hard to find time to take the Bible seriously and to read it in a meaningful way. But we must, we must, we must do that. While we recognize that this methodology, studying the Bible to learn about God, is useful, we would like to suggest some additional guidance. We've already talked about that. To get some other additional ideas about how you can read the Bible in this way, Look at our website, theox.org. See you next week.